Well, good morning again. How many of you have heard of Elon Musk? He's the guy that's designing rockets for Mars. He, he started the Tesla car company with electric cars. PayPal, if you've ever bought anything on the internet by PayPal, he was one of the guys that started that. And uh, I can assure you this, almost this whole sermon is going to be about, it's going to be from scripture, but I do have a recording. Let's try it out. I want you to hear. What do you worship? myself to the advancement of humanity uh, using technology. Do you pray? I don't. I didn't even pray when I when I almost died of malaria. Wow, that's really not praying. Right. You put your money where your bugs brain was. Yeah. Do you have a spiritual life? Uh, well, it sort of depends on what spiritual means. Um, but what do you think spiritual means? Uh, and there's certainly uh, things that we, we don't understand about the universe. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less convinced that there's, say, um, some, some super consciousness watching over our every movement and kind of evaluating it against some criteria, you know, and deciding whether we're going to go to one place or another when we die. Mm -hmm. That's unlikely. Right. I, I think that's very unlikely, right. too. Exactly. I mean, and, and, and it does beg the question, if there is some super consciousness, consciousness where did the super consciousness come from? Um, and uh, so I think the most likely explanation is uh, that uh, complexity evolved from simplicity. You know, that the simple elements over time combined to become more complex and yeah. arrived at what we are. So to be fair, you know, Mr. Musk might have said more. You know, this could have been edited down from other things. There's... He's all over the internet. You could probably listen to Musk for hours on, on YouTube or even days. He might have said more. But for the sake of these 30 or 40 minutes today, what I want to do is I'm just going to assume this is a fair representation of Musk's views. So we're going to work on this a little bit. First of all, I just want to say, by the way, I like Elon Musk. He's from South Africa. He came to America and uh, started all these, you know, he, every time his rockets land on, on legs, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, I think he's proven that he's a brilliant entrepreneur, and I, I hope his Mars rocket is a success. He's building a, market, a rocket to take 100 people at a time to Mars, to colonize Mars. I think the richest man in the world was Bill Gates, then it was uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, and I think just they announced here uh, a month or two ago that the richest man on planet Earth is Elon Musk. So I might be off by a few billion somewhere, but anyway, you can be sure that uh, Musk's views are, are worth thinking about because whatever he thinks is what a lot of other people think. So we're, gonna, we're starting with Musk here, but we're, we're going we're gonna to work on this. And by the way, the title of this talk is Why Elon Musk Doesn't Get It. So first then, what does Elon Musk worship? That was the question, right? He claims, I don't really worship anything. Then in his response, he reacts to the question of worship with the verb dedicate. He dedicates himself to the advancement of humanity. Boy, that sounds noble, doesn't it? Now, maybe he feels uncomfortable with the worship question. You know, maybe he doesn't want to admit that worshiping anything, uh, that he's worshiping anything. But now the prophet Isaiah warns us about something that I'm going to call the creaturely syndrome the creaturely syndrome. It is the desire to climb into godhood. So turn with me to Isaiah 14. I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm not invoking a, the full Satan here. I'm not trying to <laughs> suggest that Elon Musk is, is a full Satan or anything like that, or that he's the Antichrist. If you think that's where I'm going, that's not where I'm going. But if, at Isaiah 14, in a more subtle sense and just as destructive way, I want to suggest to you that Creatures, creatures play with the creaturely syndrome, and you and I, last time I checked, you know, we're creatures. Here's what Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 says. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, God is addressing through the prophet Isaiah, he's addressing Lucifer. Here's what it says. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most 
high. As a creature, Lucifer was granted an exalted existence, wasn't he? But this was not enough for him. He wanted more power. He wanted to be worshipped by the other angels, as they metaphorically here are called the stars of heaven. He wanted to be regarded above other creatures. He wanted to go to the furthest extremes, you know, on the farthest sides of the north, he wanted to ascend above the heights of the clouds. See how that goes? He nurtured in himself a bent desire to be like God, not like in traits of mercy and unselfishness, but like in terms of receiving the adulation of created beings. That's what he wanted. He wasn't saying, boy, I wish I could be more nice like God is. And that wasn't it. And so... You know, we are all social beings. We're designed that way. But Satan thought to step out of that design and brought ruin into the creation. And so, you know, Lucifer became Satan. He chose a different direction. Those of us with creaturely syndrome, we do the same thing. Perhaps we do not think we aspire to be worshipped by angels or to push God aside and, and sit on his throne in his place. But, you know... Where does creaturely syndrome take you? Where does it take you? It takes you to that place. Careful here, you know, not being a creature, but being a creature who chooses to indulge in creaturely syndrome. Being a creature is not a problem, but when you indulge in the creaturely syndrome, that's the problem. And so Paul speaks about this in Romans 1, and I'm going to invite you to turn over to Romans 1 with me. Romans chapter 1 starting at verse 19 and going out to verse through verse 25. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but become futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. These are unambiguous statements. The invisible attributes of God are what? Clearly seen. Another word that's used here, another idea, they are understood. It says they knew God. Humans who doubt the existence of God, they are without excuse. And, and then there is a because in the text, right? And because... Because is remarkably simple. It's because they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. Could it be so simple? Could it be so simple that, 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 that attitude is so giant, the attitude you live your life by is such a big deal? If you just are lacking that attitude of being glorifying God and being thankful, could that make the whole difference between what you are and, and what you are? The refusal of the creature to admit his creatureliness, that is a, the fundamental rebellion against reality. And you and I are less than God, and you know what? It's okay to be less than God, but, but when we rebel against that reality, and today there's a lot of rebellion against reality. I wish that I was this. I wish that I was that. And, and you get into some very strange thoughts about what you're wishing you were. And, you know, sometimes we get into this fundamental rebellion against reality, and it leads to the heart being darkened. It's okay to be less than God. You're a creature. I'm a creature. It's okay if, if we're less than God. So Paul goes on to describe how the creaturely syndrome leads people to become futile in their thoughts so that their foolish hearts are darkened and they profess to be wise, but in the end they become fools, the smartest people. Fools when you forget that you're a creature. 
So then ultimately the glory of God is changed to the glory of the, in, the corruptible, the creature. And in the end, the place where you land is the lowest place you, and find yourself worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. That's the problem. That's creaturely syndrome. And you can't get a shot for that. And since you're a creature and I'm a creature, we're all subject to picking up the creaturely syndrome. And so this is where Musk pushes back from the question of worship, and he says that he dedicates himself to the advancement of humanity. And that's not really a surprise. Hey, Lucifer dedicated himself to the advancement of Lucifer. But the end result was Satan, right? A holy being choosing to become adversary. That's what it, in Hebrew, Satan, it means in Hebrew, the adversary. And so Lucifer became the adversary to all for which God stands. The advancement of humanity sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound good? What's wrong, you know, with finding a cure for cancer, reducing pollution of the environment, or designing a spacecraft to colonize space? What's wrong with that? But cancer is a result of sin. Pollution is a result of sin. And there's a reason why God didn't give Adam and Eve a starship. The human race is not independent and can never become independent from God. We're not designed that way. We are dependent beings. We are moral beings. We are designed for holiness, not for gluttony. We're designed to serve and not to be served. And this is not because it's not, not because we're designed to be slaves, but because the only way beings with free will can coexist is by choosing to be patient, merciful, unselfish, and to seek to serve others. That's the only way it works. Otherwise, you need a planet full of robots, which would be pretty boring. The best way to help humanity advance is to help humans return to the design of the designer and not to choose the unreality of predatory self-sufficiency. So that's another way you could talk about this. Life this way is, if you live that way, it's predatory self-sufficiency. You know, the, the, you're running with the sharks, and you better hope that you bite first. Predatory self-sufficiency, I don't like that idea. And again, that's what it was with Lucifer. He nurtured in himself that distortion, that desire to be worshipped and served by other creatures, and all that is the creaturely syndrome and operation. And you and your neighbor and your loved ones, and all of us, quite easily could fall into the creaturely syndrome. It sounds like we're somehow against technology or advancement, but we're not. But where we are cautious is with the imagining that we are gods and that we are somehow safe without mercy and patience and self-control and we're somehow safe with self-service. No, you're not. No, you're not. We are great beings because we are made in the image of a great creator. But we are still creatures and we are still designed to worship God, not the creature. Well, we, we have to be fair, so we're moving on to the next question he was asked about, uh, do you have a spiritual life, Mr. Musk? And uh, what was his first response to that? He says, well, yeah, what does spiritual mean? <laughs> That's kind of dodgy, isn't it? But, you know, let's be fair. Let's be fair. Spiritual usually is a vague term. What do you mean when you say spiritual? What do I mean? We might not be on the same page. So we can be fair with, with Elon Musk. Now, since neither Elon nor his interviewer provided a definition of spiritual, I'm going to do it. What does spiritual mean? So, you know, I don't know. You'll see what you think about this. To me, spiritual means recognizing and being committed to the existence of a just moral code. In other words, it means to be spiritual is to acknowledge that humans are moral creatures and that there is a morality, morality outside of and beyond ourselves, and that we come into existence within that setting. To have a spiritual life means to seek to relate to those facts in a responsible manner. Okay, so that's what I think spirituality, that's one way you could think about what spirituality is. So Musk and others have an admitted wonder of the universe. They see its amazing things, and they're amazed, but they stop short of the moral part. 
Humans are just smart animals situated in an awesome playground with nothing more than mechanical rules. There is the physical and physics, and that is all. If there's any right or wrong or anything spiritual, it's just a consensus reached by some group of humans sitting alone together around the human campfire. That's all that morality is, just, just a, a group that said, yeah, we think this is right, we think this is wrong. So the, uni the universe then is an almost infinitely vast and very dangerous place. And there's no personal God and no purpose, there's no meaning, there's no goal. Just make sure you get your apple pie before you die. But that, you know, that's the wrong, that's the wrong thing. So I don't want to do that. Get your apple pie before you die. What God has revealed in Scripture tells a different story. We want to look now at something expressed by the prophet Isaiah. So to, let's turn to Isaiah 45, verses 18 to 21. Now let's notice what Isaiah says within the context, though, of what he's addressing. So in the 700s B.C., many among God's people had fallen into the worship of false idols, which could do nothing for them. And so through Isaiah, God reminded them that they were trusting in empty things. And you can read this whole section here. And in fact, at, near the beginning, we get Cyrus. God named him 100 years before he was born or thereabouts. And uh, another indication, you know, God kind of knows what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, you try that and I try that and see how that works. But God does it every time, 100%. But anyway, that's kind of the context. And he says, there's just one God. You guys are trusting in false idols, but there's just one God. Let's read it. Isaiah 45, verses 18 to 21. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, but who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has told it? From that time have not I the Lord, and there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. And you can read more about that in chapter 46 and 47. Now, neither here nor in, in, in any other place in the Bible does God say, look, read this next section, I'm going to prove that I exist. He doesn't do that. What he does, you know, faith rests upon evidence, not demonstration. An absolute demonstration would have all, kind of, all kinds of ramifications and repercussions in terms of our voluntarily accepting this idea of living unselfishly like Jesus. If we all knew for sure that God existed and he, he walked through here and said, look, you know, don't worry about faith. Here I am. That would have a lot of repercussions. He reveals truth to humans because the creation itself underwent a distortion when humans chose to rebel against God's reality. He made the earth and he intends for it to be inhabited. He's got a purpose. There's a reason why you exist. There's a reason why there's only one of you. And you might say, yeah, I, 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 know, I, I get that. I know why there's only one of me because I'm a messed up person. But God has a reason why there's just one of you. And it's not a bad reason. It's a good reason. God has a purpose for you. What's happened is that when Satan chose, when humans chose to rebel against God's reality, and Satan, of course, before that had rebelled against it, Satan, what he did, he graffitied the creation. So now the creation seems to tell differing stories. So there's kind of a veil then over the understanding of most people. On top of this, we have uh, this myth of progress, this fantasy that everything in history and everything in your life and mine has all been an advancement. Yeah, I'm doing better than I was last year. We're, we're, we're financially better off. Got more hair on my head than I had last year. My vision's improving. There's some things, reasons to think maybe the myth of progress isn't quite, quite right all the time. And then we could look at the economy and the world and peace in the world and sing Kumbaya. But you know what? 
thing, this idea of me that we're, everything's always getting better. It's not exactly true. I wish it were true. It's not true. The busyness of life has left us dependent on experts. And most of the time, the experts have bad sources and bad commitments to bad ideas. It's just the way it is. Sorry. So people think they're much better off than they are. We think we're smart. We think we're technologically advanced. When it's more true that we are worshipers of the creature rather than the creator and that our wisdom is largely foolishness. Yes, we may be able to successfully build Mars rockets, but that won't mean very much if humans get there with nothing more than the idea that morality is what a group of people who think they're smart make it. Build a civilization on that. Not happening. Musk pointed out so correctly that there are things we don't understand about the universe. That's true. But that's no excuse for avoiding or delaying processing the spiritual component of life. I would argue that lack of knowledge is not the same as lack of information. In what God has revealed, he has given sufficient evidence to guide every human being. Now remember how I defined spiritual. Spiritual means recognizing and being committed to the existence of a just moral code. In other words, to be spiritual is to acknowledge that humans are moral creatures and that there is a morality outside of and beyond ourselves and that we come into existence within that setting to have a spiritual life means to seek to relate to those facts in a responsible manner. Now to dodge into limited knowledge is not to be responsible. If you just say, well, we can't understand it. Let's move on. What's for dessert? Not to be responsible, by the way, is to be irresponsible. And I want to ask the question with gentleness, but still ask it. Every person's clock is ticking, right? Is this a time to be irresponsible about morality or a time to be more responsible than we ever have been? Well, let's go to this last thing that, he, uh, that uh, Musk said. Finally, Elon said that he thought the idea of, in his words, a some super consciousness watching over our every movement, evaluating those movements against some criteria, and then deciding at last where we go. He said he thought that was, to use his words, unlikely. Unlikely. Well, you and I know, all know that most likely, most likely what he had in mind was the idea that in the end, every person will be sent either to a place called heaven, where they will live forever and eat chocolates, or a place of fiery torment where they will experience torture forever. And we know the problems with that, right? Man does not have a soul in him. He is a soul. Man is not naturally immortal. He is conditionally immortal. Immortality is a gift given to those who agree with Jesus that the only way we can live is unselfishly. And those who, more than that, those who receive Jesus as their Savior. So instead of the idea of a personal God, so eloquently clarified by Jesus in coming and living with us all as a personal God right beside us and with us, Musk has in mind a God who is as a super consciousness. Doesn't that sound erudite? Oh, we're going to talk about God. Let's talk about a super consciousness. Well, super consciousness doesn't sound very personal to me. It seems like the main attribute he has in mind is a being that is extremely intelligent. Furthermore, if our hunch is correct, and Musk views this theory of a superconsciousness as an arbitrary being who sends you to eternal pleasures or eternal tortures, and he does so, Musk says, based on, quote, some criteria, unquote, then what you really have is a person who is giving the gift of free will. You have a person who was given, Musk, a person, all of us, a person who was given the gift of free will, who sees himself as, self as potentially subject to a very powerful and very arbitrary being 
And can we then understand why it might be difficult to be joyful about that prospect? I can understand how that could be. So when so many in Christianity left the Bible and added these unfounded traditions like the immortal souls and forever burning hell and a morally arbitrary torturing God, it created a lot of, I guess we could say for the great controversy, kind of a fog of war situation. And it painted God with, uh, Satan painted God with his own horrible attributes and he presented a fake God to the world, an impersonal, loveless, arbitrary, uh, lawless, super consciousness. And that kind of a God obviously would have no real moral criteria. Just be whatever God was feeling that day. You hope that God doesn't get up on the wrong side of his God bed, right? Because it might be a bad day for you. So I can see, I can see why uh, Musk might not want to believe in a God like that. Do you want to believe in a God like that? But I want to spend the last bit of our time here reminding us that that is a very different picture than the Bible picture of God. Let's go over to John 3. John chapter 3. We had our scripture reading from John chapter 3. So we looked at Romans 1, and we looked at Isaiah 45, but let's, let's take a little bit of our time at John chapter 3. So God is this torturing, arbitrary bad guy. It might give you something nice, might give you something really unnice. John chapter 3, we know the chapter. Let's jump over to verse 17. Because it sounded like this, uh, this super consciousness was there to kind of sort you out and put you into a box somewhere and, and make sure that some of you get into a really hot box. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. There goes your arbitrary, high-temperature God. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The same word for saving, for healing. He came to fix the place. The devil graffitied the place. Some of that graffiti landed in your DNA and mine. God came to heal us. God came to fix the place. He came not to condemn, but that the world might be saved. And that's kind of an important thing. Notice it says, through him, God did not send a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus is kind of like an inescapable piece of the picture. If you're going to be saved, it's going to be because of Jesus. And it's worth saying, you know, maybe I could get to know him. You know, maybe it's worth looking into. Elon Musk is never going to hear this sermon. He's never going to send me an email. God hears the sermon right now. God knows the facts. He wants me to have a personal, close walk with him. He is a personal God. He loves you. He has good thoughts for you. He has good plans for you. He's not going to force you. He won't force you to eat your peas and carrots. But it might be good to eat your peas and carrots. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 430, Ellen White wrote this sentence, two sentences. God, she's talking about, by the way, Don, John 3 talks about the serpent lifted up in the wilderness and how they needed to look and live. Quote, God alone was able to heal them, yet they were required to show their faith in the provision which he had made. Did you hear that? God alone was able to heal them. They could get the smartest guys in the tribes, you know, get all 12 tribes out there, or 13 you know, the two half-tribes, they could get them together and say, uh, who's the smartest guys we've got? Let's, let's find out what to do. Wouldn't have helped them. Wouldn't have done it. God alone was able to heal them, and yet, it says, they were required to show their faith in the provision which he had made. In other words, the, they were to look at the bronze serpent. They made the serpent, put it on the pole, and live, and now when the ambulance goes by, you see the serpent on the pole, right? 
you were to look and live. Patriarchs and Prophets, the next page, 431. Unlike the inert and lifeless symbol, Christ has power and virtue in himself to heal the repenting sinner. So what's going on here? Well, we, we need to show our faith in the provision he has made. We need to be, receive his gift of repentance so that we can be repentant, and God will be glad to heal us. Did you notice here at John 3? Let's go backwards just a little bit. He's talking with Nicodemus, right? And he starts up over here. Let's go back to uh, let's go back to 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's project is to save. But the God that Musk is worried about is the God whose project is to make sure some are not saved. The God of the Bible wants you to be saved. Now, we said, you know, the title of this message is Why Elon Musk Doesn't Get It. Let's read also at John 3, starting at verse 18. He who believes in him, he who believes in Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Now, that sounds pretty bad, but let's keep reading. He is condemned already because, when you see that word because, that's, that's a good one. That's really a good one to help us pay attention to what's next. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is the condemnation, here it comes, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And then here's a principle for everyone who's practice, everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. If you're resistant to the God of heaven, to taking seriously the claims thousands of years people have believed these things, if you're, if you're resistant to that, Possibly, there's a sin issue going on somewhere in your experience. I'm not, I don't, I don't know Elon Musk. I can't say. I'm not trying to throw an, a charge or an accusation on him. I'm just looking at what God tells us so that I can apply it to my heart, right? If I am stubborn and resistant to the God of heaven, it might be because I have a sin item going on, something that he wants to have clarified. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 432, one more sentence. Ellen White wrote this. And this is 100 years before Elon Musk, or, well, whatever it is. Many wander in the mazes of philosophy in search of reasons and evidence which they will never find while they reject the evidence which God has been pleased to give. I'm not sure who that describes, except that it says many. Many wander in the mazes of philosophy. If we went to John chapter 1, we could be reminded that God gives light to every person. From Adolf Hitler on down. John 1, 14 would remind us that Jesus came, God came in, the, in Jesus, and he pitched his tent. Skenade! Which means basically in Greek it means to go camping. He pitched his tent beside beside men. Jesus came camping here on planet Earth. He gave us free will. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that God paid the expensive price of sending Jesus to defeat the devil in his lair, to defeat death in the grave. Why? To restore the willing. 
And then it comes, the question comes back to us, are you and I willing? Are we willing? And I wanted to conclude over uh, a few more pages at Romans chapter 1 because we left off a verse that I sort of plan to sneak back to. Let's go over to Romans 1 at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, and here's, here it is, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And then it goes on to the part we read at the beginning. Well, we all know that God exists because it's, we understand it, it's been made clear, and so on. Here it says that um, God's wrath is revealed against people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Underneath suppress is, uh, here's your Greek word for today. <laughs> I don't guess I don't give you too many of these words, but today you've got a Hebrew and a Greek. Kadeko. Kata. Cataclysm. Have you ever heard of a cataclysm? That's when things come down. Kata is echo, is, is, is coming down. Echo is for the word that means to hold. And so kateko means those who suppress in English, and what it literally is is the combination of these two Greek words, the one that means to hold down, to hold down the truth. God's wrath is revealed against those who suppress. They, they, they're holding it down. They're holding it back. You can't have any of this. This is poison to you. Receive our truth. It's so much nicer. It's in a nice plastic wrapper. It's so much simpler. Don't worry about all... Uh, uh, there's too much reading there. Can't put this in a video. Just, just take our word for it. We've got candy, right? Donuts, donuts for the uh, donuts for unbelievers. Asparagus for believers. Friends, the devil wants to suppress the truth. And many good men and women. There's bad ideas, and there's, bad co there's commitments to bad ideas in the common thinking, the thinking that your grandchildren and your children and, and you and me are used to. I didn't even start on the evolution question, right? There's a lot of people that have addressed the evolution question very, very persuasively. But, you know, we should not, this, this, this is not to beat up Elon Musk. You know, I want him in the kingdom. I hope he's my neighbor. I think, I think what I wanted to c conclude with is uh, to come back to finally this question. Elon Musk doesn't get it. And the reason, and so many of our friends and neighbors, it's the same reason. He has this, the wrong object of worship, the creature rather than the creator. He has the wrong concept of life, material things instead of moral things. And he rejects a wrong concept of God, an impersonal, whimsical, judging superconsciousness. And I kind of do too, don't you? <laughs> I don't think he's that way. How will he or any person discover correct concepts? And then I have just these three thoughts. And now we're coming back to you. God is going to make opportunities. God's servants will make opportunities. And you are God's servants for this hour. In other words, God could send angels to Elon Musk. Do you think that would make a big difference? But if he sends human angels, maybe some friends of his, maybe somebody who's, you know, big, got a, 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 their brain's a little bit bigger and they're really good at engineering or something or good at mathematics, good at rocket science, I don't know. But somebody, I know the Lord is working to win. He's worked to win me. He's worked to win you. And he's working to win Elon Musk. I don't think Elon Musk is a, is a bad guy. But I do think that if the creaturely syndrome gets a hold of you or me or him, it's a bad ending. And Jesus will cry. So it all comes down to you. You're the church. I'm the church. We're all the church. Are we going to tell anybody about it? The Lord's going to use you. Do you have a hope? 
that some of the that the richest man on planet Earth right now maybe doesn't have. And if you have Jesus as your personal savior, you have something that he maybe apparently doesn't have. Who's richer? Elon Musk or you with your tiny bank account? You are. Brother and sister, share the wealth. Share the wealth. 